This is lecture 15. In this lecture, we're talking about functions some more. We're also talking about arrays and indirect addressing. We start by talking about functions. So again, we saw last time we began talking about functions and we saw that functions can be uh, arranged in a number of ways. They can have arguments passed in, they can have arguments passed out, they can have global variables that are uh, impacted by the function or th that supply information to the function, they can have IO that supplies information to the function, they can affect global variables, they can affect IO and so forth. All those various combinations and options. So, with functions, subroutines, and procedures, these are all extensively used in most programming language, languages. Um, and and the, reason, the reasons are manifold. For example, these kinds of things allow code to be modular. That is, you can break up a big problem into smaller parts. It provides good organization, and so that's the concept of modular. You've got this little standalone package and it kind of and it works by itself and you can test it independently of the rest of the entire whole big monstrosity if you happen to have a monstrosity that you're working with. It allows code reuse. So you don't have to keep do keep um, using the same or redeveloping the same code over and over again. You can use the same if you if there's a function that you're going to be using a lot, you can define that function and then you can just use it over and over again. Uh, or rather, you can make calls to that. This can facilitate code maintenance. So most of us, uh, at a hobbyist level, don't think a whole lot about code maintenance. But if you actually want to make uh, a living where you're actually doing the programming, then code maintenance is really critical. You need to keep track of all your revisions, what you did in each revision, and document. You need to document stuff, and so um, if you have things modular, that helps with code maintenance. So, in other words, you you may find that there's there's just one part of the, your system, your uh, your whole arrangement that isn't functioning properly. So you just need to fix that one piece. You don't even have to fix the whole thing. Okay. Also, it can allow or, or facilitate parallel code development. So one person could be working on this part while another person is working on that part. Anyway, the point is there are a number of good reasons for using things like functions, subroutines, and procedures. So with functions, we, we kind of went through this before. Let me just, just backtrack a little bit. Uh, you basically have a call that pushes the return address onto the stack. The arguments are then appropriately passed the function is executed, the return value is passed appropriately, and then global variables may be prepared, and then the return pops the ad return address off the stack and the um, into the program counter. The program counter then starts at that address. We saw also last time that when you um, when you define a function. It's, uh, it may have parameters, and there is a particular calling convention that we need to work with. So that calling convention uh, is, is associated in, in terms of the prototype this way. So we saw last time that we have some function, let's call it my function, or my func, my funky. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, and you may have a number of variables that you want to pass to your function. So remember that, that the first parameter that's passed has its high byte as R25. What the low byte is depends on whether it's a, a int 8, you int 8t, so you can pass any of these types of variables through my func. Okay, there are other things you can pass as well. We'll talk a little bit about that later when we get to the C breath, the call by reference. But anyway, for now, we're going to be passing these um, these types of variables and so the amount of space so if you recall if you pass var1 it actually goes into registers 24 and 25 
Okay, so it, in other words, it always does it in two byte increments. And so even though a, a single byte is passed, it actually takes up two bytes in terms of registers. So it actually goes into register 24. The actual value goes into register 24. Register 25 is zero. So, and, and so forth. And basically, the, the, the variables that are passed or the um, parameters that are passed take up registers R25 all the way down at max to R8. If you end up having more registers being passed than will fit in that set of registers, then it will, it will, um, they need to be pushed onto the stack. They'll be pushed onto the stack. Well, I, I'm not going to talk too much about that now. Um, if you get there, then there's like, so <laughs> this, this brings me to the, the fact that there are many different kinds of functions. There's some, you, you saw that, that diagram with all the kinds of inputs and outputs, so many different kinds of functions. It's impossible to, to, to give you a comprehensive uh, or exhaustive presentation on how to do functions in Arduino assembly because there's so many different possibilities. And you, you don't realize how complicated it is until you try to do something for which the rules are not clearly defined. <laughs> so anyway, we'll, we'll try to define, them, define some important ones here in this lecture. So th those are the, those are the uh, calling conventions for the uh, input parameters. For the output, remember a C function only allows one variable to return, to be returned. So in your prototype, you'll specify the data type, for example, uh, in a t, that's a, a byte, that's a signed integer. This is an unsigned integer, so forth. 16-bit integers, 32-bit integers. You can have those different options. So the, the data needs to go into these registers where the register 25 depends, again, on the data type you want it to return. Okay, so, so that's what. Now, it, it is your responsibility when you write the function, for example, if you write a uint, you need to make sure that you're returning an unsigned integer, not a signed integer, and, and vice versa. Uh, the, the operating system will not know if you did something intentionally or not. Okay? It doesn't know. It's not that intelligent. Okay, so anyway, this is the parameter calling convention. These are where the register, these are the registers so these are the registers for the values that are passed. These are the registers for the values that are returned. Again, R25 is, is always the high byte. Okay, now what about using global variables? How do we use global variables in uh, an Arduino assembly program? Again, the point of using global variables is that they can be used anywhere in your code. That's the point. You can use them in the C function. You can use them in this subroutine, that subroutine, this subroutine, and so forth. The challenge is that since the AT Mega 328 is an 8-bit processor, then data types larger than one byte make the problem a little bit more complicated in certain settings. So in particular, uh, well, one thing we also need to know is how do we define global variables that span the code? That is, when we say spanning the code, I mean they cross the C assembly boundaries. And how do we use the globals that span the code? So those are important questions as we come to this issue of global variable. So again, the declaration must be done in the header file, or at least that's the way I recommend it. You cannot do it. There are actually other ways to do it. I just recommend just doing a header file. It 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 uh, it's a standard way of doing things, and it uh, it it just makes it clear where things need to go. Since it's declared in the header file, it is not declared in the INO file. So in the INO file, theoretically, you should just be able to use it. <laughs> um, the global variable, however, does still need to be acknowledged in the .s file. For example, .com and .global are a good way to acknowledge a, the, a particular symbol for use as a global variable. So here's an example of 
global declarations. So here is the here is the H, the header file. This would this content would be in the header file. And again, remember that this header file must be included in the INO file. I don't know how many times I have I have created uh, an assembly program and and then and got the header going, got the INO file, got the S file, got all those three files ready to go, and then I realized it, it's not compiling. It's saying something about this uh, variable not declared. And it's like, what do you mean it's not declared? It's in the header. Oh, I didn't include the header file. Oh, boom. Well, hopefully you can learn from my mistakes. Here's the .s file. And so in the data section, here, notice I've, I have a this variable called var 8b, 8 bits, 16 bits, 32 bits. So these two are ints. This is an unsigned int. Okay. Notice that when you declare them over here in assembly, it doesn't know that you've made this, for example, an unsigned int. But what you can't, so com basically sets aside the uh, or indicates the amount of space required. And so, for example, 16 bits means 2 bytes. 32 bits means four bytes and so forth. So th those are the, pretty much the only combinations that, that we have. Um, theoretically, you can do 64 bits, but the Arduino IDE doesn't support a 64-bit um, object. So, so, but theoretically, you could do it. And and actually, if you declare it this way using the uint, actually, you can probably get away with it. But again, it's very unusual that you actually need something that large. And it's very complicated. It's cumbersome to work with uh, a data type that large when you're only when you ha only have an eight bit, <laughs> only have an eight bit uh, microprocessor or microcontroller. So, so that's how we would declare them. Okay. Now to use the global variable in C, that is in the Arduino code, in the C portion, you just use it. Okay. You just use it. You don't have to declare it. You just start using it. Okay, you can use it inside of a function, you can use it in the, the loop function, you can use it in the setup function, and you don't have to declare it. To use the global variable in the assembly code, you may use it, but you need to be careful because you need to use it one byte at a time, right? It's like um it's like uh the um the fact that the processor is only an eight bit processor. So you can only handle one you can only if you if you need to do an add, you can't do a uh, 32-bit add. You have to break it up into pieces, so that's important. Uh, incidentally, this reminds me one bite at a time. How do you eat an elephant? How do you eat an elephant? I, I mean, that's a big thing. Well, this is how you eat an elephant. One bite at a time. Okay, anyway, one bite at a time is, uh, is how we have to deal with data in the Ar Arduino in the assembly code. So here's an here's an example of working with a global global variable. So I'm assuming now that that this long var has been declared as a as a um, in the header file. So this is actually part of the INO file. So notice this is just a part of it. Uh, it's somewhere in the header file this has been declared as long. Okay? And I'm actually giving it this value okay just so remember 32 32 bits means four bytes so I get basically eight symbols there so this defines this very calls func1 okay so over here I've defined um, this as four bytes and again it's global here's func1 and the first thing I do in func1 is I is I load into so load s mm, that's a different load load s that is from basically from RAM um, into register 18 what is in long var now long var is 32 bits there's no way 32 bits is fitting in a single register what happens is it actually puts the lowest byte in that register in register 18 Okay, then the next byte is in long var plus one. So I can put that into register 19, long var plus two, I can put into register 20, 
long var plus three goes into register 21. And so I can now, I now have the whole va value, the whole long var value, all four bytes uh, available now in func one. And so we can go on and do whatever we do from there. Okay, so that's the plan. That's the approach to using a global variable. So at least that's how it's supposed to work. Um, so, in general, for globals longer than one byte, you can have weird things happen. And it, it might happen, it might not happen, but the important thing is caution needs to be taken. You probably want to test it out before you implement your code. The main problem seems to be in the initialization. Sometimes it initializes is fine, other times not so fine. Uh, once properly initiated, the global can be freely and reliably used. Even so, even if there, it has this little problem, it um, it may be um, once it's initialized properly, it can be freely and reliably used. The in initialization may require adding uh, or subtracting a value to in order to zero the variable to get the value to match what you're expecting it to be. So, I, I, I have seen that problem. Okay, so that is an issue. You, you may need to pay attention to it. Um, it may not be an issue. Okay, and there are some things that seem to help in this regard. And at the end, we'll, we'll kind of give you an example of, of how that works. All right, moving on. So what about functions and subroutines all within assembly? That is, I have in my assembly code, I call a subroutine it that's in assembly code it's not in C it's in assembly how would we do that incidentally you can also call C functions from assembly it's getting a little tricky when you start doing stuff like that okay but uh, for now let's take a look at what what it's like to call a subroutine from within your Arduino uh, your assembly program and the subroutine is in the assembly program okay well you use this instruction call Okay, that's that's one version of it. The other word is R call. So that's for a for a long jump, basically calling a function that's way far away, or a R call is a function that's not too far away. Okay, so basically this pushes the return address onto the stack and jumps to that location, wherever that label is. Okay. And then the return address is that of the next instruction after the call. Okay, the return address. Okay, so and then the instruction rat or return pops the return address off the stack and places it in the program counter. So we have that situation. So uh, again, call calls a subroutine within the entire program memory. Our call calls a subroutine within 2k of the program counter. I call is if you have more memory. Okay. Uh, and EI call um, is an indirect call uh, pointed to by the Z pointer. Okay, and so anyway, it's more it's more general. So you have th these are rarely used, but you can use them anyway. These are the call and R call are the most common. If you can use R call, it's going to be faster to use than if you use call, but just just a little bit. So again, functions, again, if there are more parameters than will fit in that space, you must place them on the stack before the call is executed. And again, we saw this before when we're using C functions, but the same thing holds for Arduino functions. If you're calling, if you're creating an, uh, a subroutine or a function that you're calling from within an Arduino program, you follow the same kinds of things. You put your, you put your parameters in these registers before the call is executed, okay. Uh, and again, if you have more parameters, then you put them on the stack before the call, and you remove them from the stack after the call. To access parameters in the stack frame, which what is called the activation record, you basically work with the stack pointer, uh, which is connected to the which is uses the Y register. So remember, these register 28 and 29 uses the Y register. You put that, you load. Uh, you load, I'm sorry, the Y register, yeah, the Y register is registers 28 and 29. Uh, three 
E and 3D correspond to the location where the stack pointer is actually kept. Okay, so we have that. Again, for, for functions that are all within Arduino, the return value is still passed in this set of registers. Again, maximum of 8 bytes. You could have up to a 64-bit return. Again, um, it's very unusual that you would use something that large, and I, I haven't actually ever used anything that large. So there may be some hiccups if you try to do that. Never tried it. So uh, if you try it, I'd appreciate letting you letting me know what happened. Okay. Now, if the return value is one byte, it is actually placed in register 24. Register 25 is returned either with all zeros, if it's a positive value, and or all ones if it's a negative value. Again, just like what happens when you have a C, uh, a C uh, calling an assembly program, assembly function, same kind of things. So, for example, if we have a function that has 11 one-byte arguments, the first nine bytes would be passed in the even-numbered registers from R24 all the way down to R8. The last two would be passed on the stack. Okay, so that's what happens in that situation. Now, if we use the Y register, if we call, and if we're going to use a call, and within our within the function that's being called, if we're going to use the, right, the Y register, we need to make sure that we um, that we save the Y register first. Generally, we're going to put it on the stack, and this is what it would look like to do that. So we would push registers 28 and 29 onto the stack, load the stack pointer into those registers. Okay, so that's how we would that's how we would work with the stack pointer. Then you can access values uh, arguments 10 so uh, the first nine bytes are easily taken into account by the by the parameters in registers 25 down to 8 arguments 10 and 11 are actually on the stack and you can access them using the stack pointer this way so that is the the, the process of using the stack in your fun with with functions to pass parameters now, when we um, when we call high-level subroutines, generally there are three types of high-level subroutines that that we can work with. The most common and the most versatile is the call by value. So that's where you actually pass a value. But we can also call by reference, which is a uh, a little bit different kind of thing. We'll talk about that. Um, and call by name is not nearly used as much. So I'm not going to even talk about that. Call by value. That is, the value of the argument is passed to the procedure. And the value is either loaded into the correct parameter register or pushed onto the stack. So either way, um, this is a good way to do it because if you pass the value, usually the way it's set up, that it doesn't alter variables in the original space from which the, uh, the function is being called. Okay? It only gets a copy of the value without knowing where that value came from. It doesn't need to know where the value came from. And it doesn't impact where that value came from. Okay, So in particular, what it doesn't do is it doesn't corrupt the variable in the original space. The original. So if you called it from your, R, from your Arduino function, it doesn't change the registers that were used to call, uh, used to pa pass. Um, I, or rather, if you called it from C, and you, you uh, call a function with a variable name, it doesn't change the value of that variable. It grabs the value of that variable and uses it, but it doesn't change the value of that variable. Okay, so that's the call by value. Very, very valuable. The second me method is, is, is called a call by reference. And this is a little bit unusual, but if you think about C, the use of C and um, pointers, Okay. This is basically uh, using C pointers in, cr in creating a function. So the reference, or rather the address to the variable, is passed instead of the actual variable. Okay. And the value of the variable is not passed. The address of the variable is passed. The subroutine can then change the originating variable. Okay. So that's, that's a little iffy, not so safe, 
And so to access the variable within the subroutine, we need to copy the addre address into an index register, which is us we're usually going to use X or Z, uh, and then use index addressing. Okay, Again, not so safe, but still doable. We're now going to move on to the subject of indirect addressing. We've kind of talked about it. We've kind of talked around it a little bit. So now we're going to kind of hit it head on, the subject of indirect addressing. So when we talk about addressing modes, there are two basic kinds of addressing modes. There's immediate and there's uh, and direct. Okay, So actually three, immediate, direct, and then indirect. So the immediate addressing is where you actually put a, a ready constant into a register. For example, load immediate. You put a, a known value, a value that I know right now, I can plug that directly into the, uh, the register. So that's immediate addressing. So load a constant. Second is direct. We load or store to data memory. One argument is the address. Okay, so we saw this before, load s, okay, and we pass the variable name. Again, that variable was defined up above using like com and global, those kinds of things. Also, the, 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 uh, the directive extern is, is sometimes used. Okay, and this, so this reads that, that uh, variable and plugs it into R18. So th in this case, there's actually an address associated with this. We don't know what the address is. The, com the compiler, when it compiles, assigns that address. So we don't, I, we don't really know what that address is, but, but when this thing is compiled, that address is known and it's plugged in here. Okay. And uh, similarly, so this is, this is loading data into that, into register 18 from that variable. I can also write out to that variable using STS. Okay. So, um, so remember, the first argument in these is always the destination of the data. So that's always, keep that in mind. First, reg first is always the destination. Now, indirect addressing now is, is the, the topic that we most, most want to consider because it's more complicated. Uh, so the, the value in index is, there's an index register. And again, the index registers can be X, Y, or Z. They're in registers 26 to 31. And they're used as the address of the data. So uh, potentially, uh, you might also have an offset. In other words, I want to be at this value, so that's like the start of the data, plus some amount. There, so there's an offset. Okay. So this addressing mode has many uses. Many uses. Okay. So this is, this is like a power tool. Okay. Uh, but as a power tool, it can be a little more, you know, you have to dig into the user's manual a little bit more to understand what's going on. But you can use it for accessing array elements, local variables, function arguments, and other uses. So here's an example of a program that, that would do this. So, uh, for example, I'm going to put the value for 24 directly into register 18. Then I'm going to put this value. Um, 08 into register 30. 30. Registers 30 and 31, remember, those are the Z uh, registers. Okay, so we're going to we put the low order, low byte, high byte. Now, th these values need to mean something. Okay, Th those are there's like addresses. We need to know what's at that address if we can actually use it. So um, we won't often do this kind of thing into a Z address just with numbers unless you happen specifically to know the particular address that you're concerned with okay and then now we're going to store data from register 18 into the address corresponding here okay and then in this case we're going to take data from z and put it into register 19 not z from the address pointed to by Z. Okay, so that's an indirect address. So if we actually went through and did this code, we basically would end up with uh, 24 in register 19, right? It gets put into gets put into uh, uh, the space indicated by Z, and then it's taken from that space and put into register 19. So actually, we have multiple copies of that value 24 in register 18 in this the address associated with 0108, 
that address would also have the value 24 in it, and then register 19 would have that value in it. Okay, so that's indirect. That's an example of indirect addressing. Okay, so um, when you do in indirect addressing, these are the possibilities you have. You can have uh, you can have a pre-decrement, a post-increment. Okay and in both the load and the store and we can also have an indirect with displacement LDD okay so that is I can I can uh, be at Z plus four plus three plus two plus one okay so I can I can for example if I have a 10 dimensional array I can stick it at Z and then I can I can check I can be working with uh, each component in that array uh, but just by changing that increment without having to change this whole quantity okay or without having to yeah without having to actually increment Z I can do a, dis a displacement from Z this way and that way Z is preserved and in case I need to use Z later I don't have to reload Z I can just leave it as Z and work with any with a with a displacement or sometimes called an offset so I can I can go up four I can go back five okay and so forth so these are some options that I have in working with um, data. So this is indirect. So if you notice, the X register does not allow you to do that kind of displacement, but the Z and the Y do. So here are registers. X is 26 and 27, 28 and 29 for Y, 30, 31 for Z. So we would have, for example, this. So if I wanted to put the, the stack, again, we saw this before. If I want to put the stack pointer the what whatever is in the uh, the, the regit um, in if I want to put the stack pointer value into register Y I can do it this way by low byte by high byte and low byte okay so again in terms of uh, working with this we have a, the pointer we ha have an increment a post increment a pre decrement okay so these are these would be examples of how we would use those kinds of uh, pointer registers. Uh, notice that there's a there's a post increment, pre decrement. There isn't a post decrement and pre increment. So we just yeah we work with what we have. So by way of example, here is some code. I can for example in data I can define a table with um, with some data. So in this case I have one two three four bytes in my table. Okay. Obviously you could have a lot more data in your table if you wanted. Global, I, here's so it somewhere I've defined a global function called func2, funky, it's funky2, okay. Um, and so to access this data now in this function, I can now work with the high eight, the high byte of the address of table one and the low byte of the address of table one, okay. And so I can put that into register Z into the Z registers and now I can access data so this puts the first byte into register 16 it increments Z and then puts the next byte into register 17 and so forth so in this case a was the first value that gets put into register 16 B is the second value it gets put into register 17 so or, so that's just an example of how we can access data from a table and put it or an array and put it into variables using this idea of indirect addressing. If you need pointer access, well, again, it's there are registers 26 to 31 that you can use for that purpose. If you need to use a 16-bit counter for some reason, that's best located. There are there are special commands that allow you to use registers 24 and 25 effectively that way. If you need to read from program memory, for example, fixed tables, then you need the Z register for that purpose. And generally, there's actually a special command that allow, that works with R0 for that purpose. So that's something that, that's helpful. If you plan to access single bits within certain registers, then register 16 to 23, uh, that is testing flags, those work well for that purpose. So, some useful tips in working with re registers.
Okay, the last topic in, in this lecture today is, a, is a working with arrays. So, in general, one way to declare an array is actually to declare it in the assembly code. So, for example, by giving it a label, the array, I can declare an, an array. So, in this case, I'm declaring an array, and the elements in the array are bytes. Okay? And so, when I want to access that data, I will again use indirect addressing to work with low 8 of my data. Uh, that should say high high 8 of my data and that then you can start using the the Z register to access the data the, the various elements in that array okay so here's an example of computing the sum of an array of elements okay so here's my array okay and I'm going to return the value res the, in the result I'm going to return the sum of these values in the va in the variable result Okay, so, so I'm only showing the S file here. There's an H file and an and a INO file that's back behind this. So this is really just looking at the assembly subroutine. So the, the function that I'm working with is called compute. How generic is that? Now, first thing I do is I put the data, the address, into Z, the Z register. I then clear register 18 and... Um, I clear register 21. So register 18 is going to be my loop index. Register 21 is going to uh, be initializing this, the, initial, the initial value of the sum. Okay, So that's where I'm going to keep track of the sum. So now I'm going to load from Z into register 22. So the first time it, it hits this, it's going to grab the value 1, it's going to put it into register 22, it's going to add register 22 into register 21, which was previously zeroed, okay? And then it's going to increment R18, so that's the, the loop counter. It's going to compare 18 with 10. There are 10 values in our array, so it's going to compare immediate, okay? Then it's going to branch if lower loop test, that is, if we're not up to 10 yet. So for less than 10, it's going to go back to loop test. Otherwise, it's going to continue here. It's going to load the, result, the, the value into result. So remember, result is this global variable. And then it's going to return. So, so this is one way of, instead of returning the value through register 25, it returns the value through the global variable result. Okay, so a little bit, a little bit different way. Another way to create an array, in this case, an array that's not necessarily filled with stuff, that just has, uh, you want to pre-allocate the space for, is you can use the dot space directive. Okay, the dot space directive and the space array. So the dot space directive is of this form. You pass it a size, and then al alternately, you would pass it the fill. In other words, you could, you could return it filled with values or um, not. So size basically tells you how many bytes are going to be set aside for this space. So basically, this is not setting up an array per se. It's, it's just creating space, and you can put whatever you want in there. It could be bytes. It could be whatever. I mean, you're just, you're just setting aside, let's say, 20 bytes. It's just going to create a hole in program memory, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to just leave it with nothing in it. So if you do not put fill in there, it will it will zero all of those values. Okay, it'll initialize them to be zero. So here's an example. So data one dot space seven. So it's going to actually make space for eight bytes, zero to seven. And then here's the global com compute command. Again, I take the high the high and low bytes from data one, pass them into the Z register, and then I begin working with them. Okay, so again, we, we can access the, the, the data that way. So um, in this case, the first thing we do is actually put data into that array. Okay, and then we continue on with whatever we want to do after that. Okay, so we would first put the data into the array. So that's, that's a second way to do array. 
So the first way was actually to define like dot byte, okay? Or you could do, if you have longer uh, amounts of data, you could say dot word, and that would that would allow you to put in words, okay? Um, the, the, the second way is to actually use the dot space, and then you go through and you would put whatever you want into that space. So here, uh, you don't necessarily define the values up front. Okay, so that's important because sometimes the values you want to put into your array are calculated values. You have to calculate something and then you're going to put what you calculate into the array as opposed to knowing ahead of time what's going on or having to do the calculation ahead of time. Okay, so a third way of doing arrays is using what are called external or global arrays. So in our header file, for example, I can define my array, in this case, U N A T my array five elements and so I put these five elements in there okay and then in in my um, in my dot s file notice instead of doing com and global I do extern okay I do extern and that that will allow me to access the um, the value I also have com as the result in COM1, and again, I would go through and, and load my array, which I have defined over here, uh, and load its address into Z, and then I can continue on and do whatever. Okay, so in this case, the array was defined globally through the, in this case, in this case, the values were, were put in the declaration. Uh, again, you could have defined this without defining the values and then in your C part of the program you could fill in the array and then in here you can again you can access them okay so all kinds of ways so what we've been looking at are primarily um, one-dimensional arrays uh, but of course there are other kinds of arrays there are multi-dimensional arrays there are strings which basically is an array of characters then there are string arrays and so forth. So there are other kinds of arrays. Things get things start to get pretty complicated, and manipulating those things gets really compli complicated. It's often more effective to actually work with these kinds of arrays directly in C as opposed to Arduino. Now, if it's if it's a fairly straightforward thing, like for example, a multi-dimensional array is not too bad. Okay, the the trick there is is basically in, in assembly language, a multi-dimensional array is basically a very long one-dimensional array. So you can think, for example, of, of all, the, all the, if you had a multi-dimensional array with multiple rows, you can think of all the rows put side by side into one long, one long array. Okay, so that's kind of how you have to think about multi-dimensional array or at least a two-dimensional array three-dimensional and so on you could do all those but again indexing is the is the tricky part there so uh, again it, if you if you need to use those it's often best to use something like C or C++ or you know something that's object-oriented because that's that's getting really complicated and and trying to handle those things in, our, in assembly is really not efficient. It's your, the amount of coding time it's going to take to use that is not is not a particularly effective use of time. And it's doubtful that you'll save a whole lot of, uh, uh, for example, execution time in the process. So anyway, mostly what we're using assembly language for are pretty simple problems, simple problems that we want to go fast, uh, and so that's important. Okay, the last thing I want to do is what I now call hands-on Arduino. <laughs> hands-on Arduino. So this is a new component that I'm adding uh, where in each of these lectures, I actually want to show you an actual Arduino program that's, that's run, the running, okay? And so you can see that, yes, this stuff actually works. I'm not just making it up. Uh, we can actually use this stuff, okay? And so that's that's this portion of our program. In this part of our program now, we're going to be looking at 
a particular a particular uh, function. Um, so here is our header file that we're going to be using. So again, standard integer h uh, x turn c, and I'm going to define this long this int 32 called long count. Okay, and then um, I want to define two functions, increment and decrement. And these th these functions take no parameters and return no parameters, but they they work with long count. Now it would be too easy at this point to just write a function that returns long count, uh, but I want it to be a global variable. So anyway, so uh, we'll just uh, we'll work with it as a global variable. So x turn c, okay. In my Arduino program, my INO file, um, x turn. Notice I haven't defined it long count. So I can I start using it right away, even though I haven't actually defined it in this part. But I need to remember include that .h file. Okay. So um, so first I, I serial print whatever's in there to begin with. I load some value in. So this is just kind of something easy to recognize that it's in fact 32 bits. That so a a b b c c d d is pretty easy to keep track of. And then I I print to show that it's actually in there. I increment it and print what's what's going on. I increment again, print what's going on, decrement, decrement again. Okay, so it'll change from that value and then it'll come back to that value. Okay, so that's what that's what the program basically does. There's nothing in the loop program. Okay, and then in the the S file, the all important S file. Here we go. Data, I define long count four bytes as a global. And then I define my two functions, increment and decrement. Increment is here, okay. And um, so basically, I load long count. So that's the low byte of that variable. I put into register 18. The next byte I put into register 19. The next byte after that, register 20. Then register 21. I then so that, remember, this is increment. So I'm going to just increment that long count. So incrementing that, then I first re increment register 18. I add with carry register 19 and R1. R1. What's in R1? R1 hasn't been used anywhere. How do we know what's even in R1? What if R1 is full of garbage? Why would I want to add something with garbage to R19? Aha. Mm hmm. I'm glad you asked. Well, the reason is R1, remember, is the register that we just assume is always going to have zero in it. Okay, so I'm adding to register 19, zero. The real thing I want to do is I want to see if there's a carry. If there's a carry, I want to keep track of that. Okay, and so notice I do that with register 19, register 20, and register 21. So if the carry here creates another carry, I want to be able to keep track of all of those carries as we go along. So even though we're actually only adding zero, we're also including the carry, and that's really important. Okay, and then now I take registers 18 through 21, and I put them back into the bytes associated with long count. Okay, so that's what this is doing. So there's an LDS loading from static, storing to static, and then I return. Okay, so that's what, that's what increment is doing. Decrement basically does the same thing, but instead of incrementing, it decrements, and then it subtracts with carry, and so it's subtracting zero, okay, and so forth. So we, we go all the way through, and we do the full 32-bit decrement, okay, load the values back in from registers 18 to 21, and then return. So increment, decrement basically do the same kind of thing, but you can see there's a lot of stuff going on that needs to happen. Um, and we probably could have simpl simplified this by, uh, by uh, anyway, probably could have simplified it, but this is what we, this is a, a, a reasonable implementation. Okay, I go through and I compile. Da da da, compiling sketch. Ooh, is it going to give me problems? Okay, and it went through and it loaded. Okay, because I actually pressed the load upload button. So I check the serial monitor, see what's happening. So notice that. The first value it often gives is just kind of a bogus value. It's uh, it's something, and then it restarts. When it restarts, it starts, and the first value printed out is zero. So let's go back to our C function where we actually had the printout. 
So the first value is, notice it's printed out before we actually assign any value to it. And so notice the in initial value is zero. Then we put in the value, value a, a, B, B, C, C, D, D, and we print it out, and that's the value we get. We increment, and so notice we went from D to E, increment again, we go from D to F, from E to F. We decrement, which go, means we go back to E, decrement again, we go back to D, and so forth. So we're, we're back at the beginning. So if I take my, Ar my trusty Arduino now, and if I push the reset button, it's going to do this whole thing again. Okay, so that's another trick that you can use. Um, sometimes it's like, well, oh, can I just like clear the whole thing, clear the whole s console, and then um, and then um, start it again? So you can do that by actually uh, closing the, the monitor and then opening it again. That will do a reset as well. So that'll that'll clear the screen and it'll do a reset and start your program over again. So that's kind of a little trick too. So, hands on Arduino. So we've shown how to use along as a global variable. Along with all the other functions we could do, this is just to give you an illustration of one particular thing. You can try at home. Notice I didn't have to have any external hardware to do this. I can do all of this just with the Arduino itself. Wasn't that fun? Thanks for watching.